Hi, I'm Nate Adams, and this is the cover from the chapter of my book about sizing your HVAC or your furnace and air conditioning correctly and as small as possible. So this is purposely meant to be a bit on the silly side. It's the little furnace that could. All of us remember the story of the little engine that could that uh, pulled the train that it didn't think it could pull full of toys for the good boys and girls on the other side of the mountain up and over the mountain. So it turned out the engine could do it just fine and we find that it is remarkable how small of a furnace or heat pump or boiler or whatever else you're using to heat and cool your home, uh, how small it can be and still do a good job as long as the house is reasonably tight. It doesn't need to be super airtight, but it needs to be a little bit tight. So let's walk through a couple of real world examples uh, with this. So for starters, these are four really common comfort problems. So the first thing is you have a room that is the furthest away from the furnace. So this is typically a master bedroom. Sometimes it's a living room, something like that. But it runs, say, 5, 10, 15 degrees different from other rooms in the house. And there's just nothing you can do about it. And that is, in fact, true if your furnace is too large, which we'll get into. The second one is a bonus room over a garage in newer houses. This is a really difficult space to heat and cool well. Air leakage is often a big driver here, uh, but not always. Uh, the third one is if you have knee wall construction. So you have uh, little short walls that are, say, four feet tall, and then you have sloped ceilings. This is really common in Cape Cods or bungalows, or actually that bonus room that I just talked about is built like that that area is typically super hard to heat and cool well. And then the last common one is uh, an addition that has lots of exposed sides, or sometimes and it's a bump out in the house. So it has a lot of the, the outside area uh, being exposed to the outdoors compared to other rooms, which only have, say, two walls exposed to the outdoors. Uh, those are the really common issues that we see. Now, what's going on here is most of the time it's not that hot and it's not that cold. So I like to look at this as a little red Corvette. So your goal with a Corvette is just to go 70 miles an hour all the time or 70 degrees. Uh, so the only time when it really even needs to work is when it's really cold outside in the winter and when it's really hot outside in the summer. That's when you have a hill. That's when you need some more horsepower. But you don't need a huge amount of horsepower because you're not accelerating up the hill. You're just trying to hold 70. So it's remarkable how little power it actually takes. And here's something that's also really important to understand that's related to this. So spring and fall are the majority of the year and the temperatures are not super crazy. So this is the hourly temperatures plotted as days for Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, so I call it kind of cold, 25 to 50 degrees, and moderate, 50 to 75 degrees. These two, when you add them up, are about 10 months out of the year. This is most of the year. You're basically on the flat. You don't need a lot of heat. You don't need a lot of cool. And most HVAC systems that I see are two to three times larger than they need to be on the really cold and the really hot day. So they are way oversized. They're four, five, six times larger than they need to be. So you end up with this jerkiness. Here's what uh, these houses look like. You see 10 to 15 degree differences between rooms and you see lots of spikes and valleys, up, down, up, down, up, down. And the other rooms are running much hotter or much colder. Uh, so when you have all of that acceleration, the house can heat up or cool down really quickly, but that's not comfortable. You notice those temperature swings. And particularly in those rooms that are problematic, they usually need more heating and cooling per square foot than the rest of the house. But because they are further away, they have longer ducts uh, uh, and so forth, they usually get less heating and cooling. This is a real problem and it's extremely difficult to fix comfort problems when you have the wrong piece of HVAC, which is why we are routinely recommending ripping out new equipment. 
which I hate doing. I don't like telling people you just burned $5,000, but you did, maybe 10. Uh, it's a really frustrating recommendation for me to deliver, and it's a lot of why I've spent all the time writing uh, this book. So let's take a look. This is an actual house, because I would understand if you don't believe me, uh, but this is uh, from an Ecobee thermostat, which uh, logs, it does data logging, it tracks uh, a bunch of things over time. And this is a friend of mine's house, it's actually one of his rentals, and you can see that the temperature goes up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, just like I showed you a minute ago. Um, down here, this is equipment runtime. So whenever you see a red bar, that means the furnace turned on. You can see that it doesn't run very long anywhere. It just turns on and then turns off. And you can see every time it turns on, it jumps the temperature and it falls back down. This is uncomfortable. People don't like living in houses with drastically oversized equipment. Um, what they prefer is this. So now we don't have a huge difference between rooms. We're down to maybe two or three degrees. And you can see the temperature moves really slowly. This is what you want to see. This is ideal. And here's an actual client house with that. So this house has had a fair amount of air sealing and insulation work done to it. Uh, so take a look at the green line. This is the temperature inside the house. Look, it is almost dead flat. It just doesn't move. Um, and the outside temperature, meanwhile, in black here, this is getting over 90. So you can see right where I uh, put this line, it's 93 degrees outside. Uh, for Cleveland, this is super hot. We don't break 90, but for a few hours a year. Uh, and these were two of the hottest days of the summer two years ago. But take a look at the runtime down here. You can see that the equipment's running a pretty good long time. This is the air conditioning. Uh, but this, these are two of the hottest days of the year. So this thing shouldn't shut off. It should just run and run and run and run and run. But you can see all the white, that is time when this system is not running. Now, in this case, he got away with it um, because there was so much shell work done, the air sealing insulation. Uh, so the house remained fairly comfortable. But most of the time, if your HVAC system is too big, it makes getting a flat line like this essentially impossible and then you're going to notice differences. So I really can't recommend uh, smaller equipment more because he could have the size of this air conditioner and it would still work fine. It would be just fine even on the hottest days of the year. Uh, so it's it's really frustrating that I consistently see the wrong size HVAC in client homes and that it doesn't work very well. So that's why I wrote this chapter. Again, it's the sizing chapter of the book. Now, most of the chapters in the book are free. My general rule of thumb is if there's a lot of nitty-gritty, if I go into some high levels of technical detail, I want to charge for that uh, because, sadly, the bank wants their money every month. Uh, but at the same time, I want to be sure to provide as much information as possible to consumers so that I can help people beyond my clients save a lot of money because I hate making recommendations to rip out new HVAC equipment. It, it's just miserable. I don't like doing it. Um, so if you find this information interesting, please like the video below. Uh, don't forget to subscribe and leave a comment. This is very counterintuitive stuff. What did you think? Uh, did I do a decent job presenting the information? Or do you think that I'm crazy? Both are fine. I would rather understand where you're coming from. So again, like, subscribe, and comment. And thanks for taking a little time out of your day to watch. I'm Nate Adams. Have a great day.